appeals to racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism, to rabid nationalist fervor, are beginning not to work. This is who I am, and whether I'm good or bad, or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way. Just a ride. And we can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. I realized that I had the game wrong. But the game was to find out what I already was. We were saying how very important it is to bring about in the human mind the radical revolution. The crisis is a crisis in consciousness, a crisis that cannot anymore accept the old norms, the old patterns, the ancient traditions. And considering what the world is now, with all their misery, conflict, destructive brutality, aggression, and so on, man is still as he was, is still brutal, violent, aggressive, acquisitive, competitive, and he has built a society along these lines. Society today is composed of a series of institutions. From political institutions, legal institutions, religious institutions, to institutions of social class, familial values, and occupational specialization, it is obvious the profound influence these traditionalized structures have in shaping our understandings and perspectives. Yet, of all the social institutions we are born into, directed by, and conditioned upon, there seems to be no system as taken for granted and misunderstood as the monetary system. Taking on nearly religious proportions, the established monetary institution exists as one of the most unquestioned forms of faith there is. How money is created, the policies by which it is governed, and how it truly affects society are unregistered interests of the great majority of the population.
In a world where 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth, in a world where 34,000 children die every single day from poverty and preventable diseases, and where 50% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day, one thing is clear, something is very wrong. And whether we are aware of it or not, the lifeblood of all of our established institutions, and thus society itself, is money. Therefore, understanding this institution of monetary policy is critical to understanding why our lives are the way they are. Unfortunately, economics is often viewed with confusion and boredom. Endless streams of financial jargon coupled with intimidating mathematics quickly deters people from attempts at understanding it. However, the fact is, the complexity associated with the financial system is a mere mask designed to conceal one of the most socially paralyzing structures humanity has ever endured. A number of years ago, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, produced a document entitled Modern Money Mechanics. This publication detailed the institutionalized practice of money creation as utilized by the Federal Reserve and the web of global commercial banks it supports. On the opening page, the document states its objective. The purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. It then proceeds to describe this fractional reserve process through various banking terminology. A translation of which goes something like this. The United States government decides it needs some money, so it calls up the Federal Reserve and requests, say, ten billion dollars. The Fed replies, saying, sure, we'll buy ten billion in government bonds from you. So the government takes some pieces of paper, paints some official looking designs on them, and calls them treasury bonds. Then it puts a value on these bonds to the sum of ten billion dollars and sends them over to the Fed. In turn, the people at the Fed draw up a bunch of impressive pieces of paper themselves, only this time calling them Federal Reserve Notes, also designating a value of ten billion dollars to the set. The Fed then takes these notes and trades them for the bonds. Once this exchange is complete, the government then takes the ten billion in Federal Reserve Notes and deposits it into a bank account. And, upon this deposit, the paper notes officially become legal tender money, adding 10 billion to the U.S. money supply. And there it is. 10 billion in new money has been created. Of course, this example is a generalization, for, in reality, this transaction would occur electronically, with no paper used at all. In fact, only 3% of the U.S. money supply exists in physical currency. The other 97% essentially exists in computers alone. Now, government bonds are, by design, instruments of debt. And when the Fed purchases these bonds, with money it essentially created out of thin air, the government is actually promising to pay back that money to the Fed. In other words, the money was created out of debt. This mind-numbing paradox of how money or value can be created out of debt or a liability will become more clear as we further this exercise. So the exchange has been made and now ten billion dollars sits in a commercial bank account. Here's where it gets really interesting. For as based on the fractional reserve practice, that ten billion dollar deposit instantly becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And regarding reserve requirements, as stated in Modern Money Mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a $10 billion deposit, 10% or 1 billion is held as the required reserve while the other nine billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now, it is logical to assume that this nine billion is literally coming out of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. 
However, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the 9 billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing 10 billion dollar deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in modern money mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the 9 billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a 10 billion dollar deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available 9 billion dollars. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated and in turn 90% of the 9 billion or 8.1 billion is now available as newly created money for more loans. And of course that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency. They don't say debase the currency, they don't say devalue the currency, they don't say cheat the people who are saved, they say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the US dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought, for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates. For in our financial system, money is debt and debt is money. Here is a chart of the US money supply from 1950 to 2006. Here is a chart of the US national debt for the same period. How interesting it is that the trends are virtually the same. For the more money there is, the more debt there is. The more debt there is, the more money there is. To put it a different way, every single dollar in your wallet is owed to somebody by somebody. For remember, the only way the money can come into existence is from loans. 
Therefore, if everyone in the country were able to pay off all debts, including the government, there would not be one dollar in circulation. In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913, the Federal Reserve. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. Now, so far we have discussed the reality that money is created out of debt, through loans. These loans are based on a bank's reserves, and reserves are derived from deposits. And through this fractional reserve system, any one deposit can create nine times its original value, in turn debasing the existing money supply, raising prices in society. And since all this money is created out of debt, and circulated randomly through commerce, people become detached from their original debt and a disequilibrium exists where people are forced to compete for labor in order to pull enough money out of the money supply to cover their costs of living. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation. And it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself the application of interest. When the government borrows money from the Fed, or when a person borrows money from a bank, it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest. In other words, almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well. But, if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. The ramifications of this are staggering, for the amount of money owed back to the banks will always exceed the amount of money that is available in circulation. This is why inflation is a constant in the economy for new money is always needed to help cover the perpetual deficit built into the system, caused by the need to pay the interest. What this also means is that mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and there will always be poor pockets of society that get the short end of the stick. An analogy would be a game of musical chairs, for once the music stops, somebody is left out to dry. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly who was challenging the foreclosure of his home by the bank which provided the loan to purchase it. His argument was that the mortgage contract required both parties, being he and the bank, each put up a legitimate form of property for the exchange. In legal language, this is called consideration. Mr. Daly explained that the money was, in fact, not the property of the bank, for it was created out of nothing as soon as the loan agreement was signed. Remember what modern money mechanics stated about loans? What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits. Reserves are unchanged by the loan transactions, but deposit credits constitute new additions to the total deposits of the banking system. In other words, the money doesn't come out of their existing assets. 
the bank is simply inventing it, putting up nothing of its own except for a theoretical liability on paper. As the court case progressed, the bank's president, Mr. Morgan, took the stand and in the judge's personal memorandum, he recalled that the plaintiff, bank's president, admitted that in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank did create the money and credit upon its books by bookkeeping entry. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law or statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. The jury found that there was no lawful consideration and I agree. He also poetically added, only God can create something of value out of nothing. And upon this revelation, the court rejected the bank's claim for foreclosure and daily kept his home. The implications of this court decision are immense. For every time you borrow money from a bank, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card charge, the money given to you is not only counterfeit, it is an illegitimate form of consideration and hence voids the contract to repay for the bank never had the money as property to begin with. Unfortunately, such legal realizations are suppressed and ignored and the game of perpetual wealth transfer and perpetual debt continues. And this brings us to the ultimate question, why? During the American Civil War, President Lincoln bypassed the high interest loans offered by the European banks and decided to do what the founding fathers advocated, which was to create an independent and inherently debt-free currency. It was called the greenback. Shortly after this measure was taken, an internal document circulated between private British and American banking interests stated, Slavery is but the owning of labor and carries with it the care of laborers. While the European plan is that capital shall control labor by controlling wages. This can be done by controlling the money. It will not do to allow the greenback as we cannot control that. The fractional reserve policy perpetrated by the Federal Reserve which has spread in practice to the great majority of banks in the world is in fact a system of modern slavery. Think about it. Money is created out of debt. And what do people do when they are in debt? They submit to employment to pay it off. But if money can only be created out of loans, how can society ever be debt free? It can't. And that's the point. And it is the fear of losing assets coupled with the struggle to keep up with the perpetual debt and inflation inherent in the system, compounded by the inescapable scarcity within the money supply itself, created by the interest that can never be repaid, that keeps the wage slave in line. Running on the hamster wheel with millions of others, in effect powering an empire that truly benefits only the elite at the top of the pyramid. For, at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. They are the true masters, along with the corporations and governments they support. Physical slavery requires people to be housed and fed. Economic slavery requires people to feed and house themselves. It is one of the most ingenious scams for social manipulation ever created and at its core it is an invisible war against the population. Debt is the weapon used to conquer and enslave societies and interest is its prime ammunition. And as the majority walks around oblivious to this reality the banks, in collusion with governments and corporations, continue to perfect and expand their tactics of economic warfare, spawning new bases, such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, while also inventing a new type of soldier, the birth of the economic hitman. We economic hitmen really have been the ones responsible for creating this first truly global empire. And we work many different ways.
but perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations, but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. So there was that whole mushrooming thing and it's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work. They put a country in debt, it's such a big debt it can't pay it, and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest. And you demand this quid pro quo, which you call a conditionality or good governance, which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources, in, in, including many of their social services, their utility companies, their school systems sometimes, their, their, their penal systems, their insurance systems to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. The precedent for economic hitmen really began back in the early 50s when democratically elected Mossadegh, who was elected in Iran, he was considered to be the hope for democracy in the Middle East and around the world. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. But one of the things that he'd run on and began to implement was the idea that foreign oil companies needed to pay the Iranian people a lot more for the oil that they were taking out of Iran. The Iranian people should benefit from their own oil. Strange policy. We didn't like that, of course. But we were afraid to do what we normally were doing, which was to send in the military. Instead, we sent in one CIA agent, Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's relative. And Kermit went in with a few million dollars and was very, very effective and efficient. And in a short amount of time, he managed to get Mossadegh overthrown and brought in the Shah of Iran to replace him, who always was favorable to oil. And it was extremely effective. overflow Tehran. Army officers shout that Mossadegh has surrendered and his regime as virtual dictator of Iran is ended. Pictures of the Shah paraded through the streets as sentiment reverses. The Shah is welcomed home. So back here in the United States, uh, in Washington, people looked around and said, wow, that was easy and cheap. So this established a whole new way of manipulating countries, of, of creating empires. The only problem with Roosevelt was that he was a card-carrying CIA agent, and had he been caught, the ramifications could have been pretty serious. So very quickly at that point, the decision was made to use private consultants to, to, to channel the money through the World Bank or the IMF or one of the other such agencies, to bring in people like me who worked for private companies. So that if we got caught, there would be no governmental ramifications. When Arbenz became president of Guatemala, the country was very much under the thumbs of United Fruit Company, the, the big international corporations. And Arbenz ran on the sticker that says, you know, we want to get the land back to the people. And once he took power, he was, he was implementing policies that would, that would do exactly that, give land rights back to the people. United Fruit didn't like that very much. And so they hired a public relations firm, launched a huge campaign in the United States to convince the United States, the people, the citizens of the United States, and the press of the United States, and the Congress of the United States, that Arbenz was a so Soviet puppet. And that if we allowed him to stay in power, the Soviets would have a foothold in this, uh, in this hemisphere. And, and that, at, at, at that point in time, was a huge fear on everybody's mind, the Red Terror, the Communist Terror. And so, to make a long story short, 
out of this public relations campaign came a commitment on the part of the CIA and the military to take this man out. And in fact, we did. We sent in planes, we sent in, we sent in soldiers, we sent in jackals, we sent everything in to take him out, and did take him out. And as soon as he was removed from office, the new guy that took over after him basically reinstated everything to the big international corporations, including United Fruit. Ecuador, for many, many years, had been ruled by pro-U.S. dictators, often relatively brutal. Then it was decided that they were going to have a truly democratic election. Jaime Roldos ran for office, and his main goal, he said, as president, would be to make sure that Ecuador's resources were used to help the people. And he won, overwhelming, by more votes than anybody had ever won anything in Ecuador. And he began to implement these policies to make sure that the profits from oil went to help the people. Well, we didn't like that in the United States. I was sent down as one of several economic hitmen to change Roldos, to corrupt him, to bring him around, to let him know, you know, okay, you know, you can get very rich, you and your family, if you, if you play our game, but if you, just, if you continue to try to keep these policies you've promised, uh, you, you, you're gonna go. He wouldn't listen. He was assassinated. As soon as the plane crashed, the whole area was cordoned off. The only people allowed in were U.S. military from a, from a nearby base and some of the Ecuadorian military. When an investigation was launched, two of the key witnesses died in car accidents before they had a, a chance to testify. A lot of very, very strange things that went on around the, the assassination of Jaime Roldos. I, like most people who have really looked at this case, have absolutely no doubt that it was an assassination. And of course, in my position as an economic hitman, I was always expecting something to happen to Jaime, whether it be a coup or assassination, I wasn't sure, but that he would be taken down because he was not being corrupted. He would not allow himself to be corrupted the way we wanted to corrupt him. Omar Torrijos, president of Panama, was, you know, one of my favorite people. I really, really liked him. He was very charismatic. He was a guy who really wanted to help his country. And when I tried to bribe him or corrupt him, he said, look, John, he called me Juanito. He said, look, Juanito, um, I don't need the money. What I really need is for my country to be treated fairly. I need for the United States to repay the debts that you owe my people for all the destruction you've done here. I need to be in a position where I can help other Latin American countries win their independence and, and, and be free of this, of this terrible presence from the North that you people are exploiting us so badly. I need to have the Panama Canal back in the hands of the Panamanian people. That's what I want. And so leave me alone. Don't, you know, don't, try, to, don't try to bribe me. It was 1981, and in May, Jaime Roldos was assassinated. And Omar was very aware of this. Torrijos got his family together and he said, I'm probably next, but it's okay because I've done what I came here to do. I've renegotiated the canal. The canal will now be in our hands. He just finished negotiating the treaty with Jimmy Carter. In June of that same year, just a couple of months later, he also went down in an airplane crash which there's no question was executed by CIA-sponsored jackals. Tremendous amount of evidence that one of, that one of Torrijos' security guards handed him at the last moment as he was getting on the plane a tape recorder, a small tape recorder, that contained a bomb. It is interesting to me how this system has continued pretty much the same way for years and years and years, except the economic hitmen have got better and better and better. Then we come up with, very recently, what happened in Venezuela. In 1998, Hugo Chavez gets elected president, following a long line of presidents who had been very corrupt and basically destroyed the economy of the country. And Chavez was elected amidst all that. Chavez stood up to the United States, and he's done it primarily demanding that Venezuelan oil be used to help the Venezuelan people. Well, we didn't like that in the United States. So in 2002, the coup was staged, which is no question in my mind, in most other people's minds, that the CIA was behind that coup. The 
way that that coup was fomented was very reflective of what Kermit Roosevelt had done in Iran, of, of paying people to go out into the streets to riot, to protest, to say this Chavez is very unpopular. You know, you, if you can get a few thousand people to do that you, you, in television, you can make it look like it's the whole country, and things start to mushroom. Except in the case of Chavez, he was smart enough, and the people were so strongly behind him that they overcame it, which was a phenomenal moment in the history of Latin America. Iraq actually is a perfect example of the way the whole system works. So we economic hitmen are the first line of defense. We go in and we try to corrupt the governments and, and get them to accept these huge loans, which we then use as leverage to basically own them. If we fail, as I failed in, in Panama with Omar Torrijos and in Ecuador with Jaime Roldos, men who refuse to be corrupted, then the second line of defense is we send in the jackals. And the jackals either overthrow governments or they assassinate. And once that happens and a new government comes in, and boy, it's going to toe the line because the new president knows what will happen if he doesn't. In the case of Iraq, uh, both of those things failed. Economic hitmen were not able to get through to Saddam Hussein. We tried very hard. We tried to get him to accept a deal very similar to what the House of Saud had accepted in Saudi Arabia, but he wouldn't accept it. And so the jackals went in to take him out. They couldn't do it. His security was very good. Um, after all, he had one time worked for the CIA. He'd been hired to assassinate a former president of, of, of Iraq and failed, but he knew the system. So in 91, we send in the troops and we take out the Iraqi military. So we assume at that point that Saddam Hussein is going to come around. We could have taken him out, of course, at that time, but we didn't want to. He's the kind of strong man we like. He controls his people. He could, we thought he could control the Kurds and keep the Iranians in their border and keep pumping oil for us. And that once we took out his military, now he's going to come around. So the economic hitmen go back in in the 90s without success. If they'd had success, he'd still be running the country. We'd be selling him all the fighter jets he wants and everything else he wants. But they couldn't. They, they, they didn't have success. The jackals couldn't take him out again. So we sent the military in once again, and this time we did the complete job and took him out and in the process created for ourselves some very, very lucrative construction uh, deals. We had to reconstruct a country that we essentially destroyed, which is a pretty good deal if you own construction companies, big ones. So, you know, Iraq shows the three stages. The economic hitmen failed there, the jackals failed there, and as a final measure, the military goes in. And in that way, we've really created an empire, but we've done it very, very subtly. It's clandestine. All the empires of the past were built on the military, and everybody knew they were building them. So the, the British knew they were building them, the French, the Germans, the, the Romans, the, the Greeks, and they were proud of it. And they always had some excuse like spreading civilization, spreading some religion, something like that, but they, they knew they were doing it. We don't. The majority of the people in the United States have no idea that we're living off the benefits of a clandestine empire. That today there's more slavery in the world than ever before. And then you have to ask yourself, well, if it's, if it's an empire, then who's the emperor? Obviously, our presidents of the United States are not emperors. An emperor is someone who's not elected, doesn't serve a limited term, and doesn't report to anyone, essentially. So you can't classify our presidents that way. But we do have what I consider to be the equivalent of the emperor, and it's what I call the corporatocracy. The corporatocracy is this group of individuals who run our biggest corporations, and they really act as the emperor of this empire. Um, they control our media, either through direct ownership or advertising. They control most of our uh, politicians because they finance their campaigns, either through their corporations or through personal contributions that come out of the corporations. They're not elected, they don't serve a limited term, they don't report to anybody. And at the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton, and, and the next moment he's vice president of the United States, or the president who was in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have them moving back and forth through the revolving door. 
And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government, they become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. This process of manipulation by the corporatocracy through the use of debt, bribery, and political overthrow is called globalization. Just as the Federal Reserve keeps the American public in a position of indentured servitude through perpetual debt, inflation, and interest, the World Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt, either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country, then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies, often consisting of the following. Currency devaluation. When the value of a currency drops, so does everything valued in it. This makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth. Large funding cuts for social programs. These usually include education and health care, compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. For example, in 1999, the World Bank insisted that the Bolivian government sell the public water system of its third largest city to a subsidy of the U.S. corporation Bechtel. As soon as this occurred, water bills for the already impoverished local residents skyrocketed. It wasn't until after a full-blown revolt by the people that the Bechtel contract was nullified. Then there is trade liberalization, or the opening up of the economy through removing any restrictions on foreign trade. This allows for a number of abusive economic manifestations, such as transnational corporations bringing in their own mass-produced products, undercutting the indigenous production and ruining local economies. An example is Jamaica which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Another variation is the creation of numerous, seemingly unnoticed, unregulated, inhumane sweatshop factories, which take advantage of the imposed economic hardship. Additionally, due to production deregulation, environmental destruction is perpetual as a country's resources are often exploited by the indifferent corporations while outputting large amounts of deliberate pollution. The largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron. So today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco, estimated to be more than 18 times what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar. In 1960, the income gap between the fifth of the world's people in the richest countries versus the fifth in the poorest countries was 30 to 1. By 1998, it was 74 to 1. While global GNP rose 40% between 1970 and 1985, those in poverty actually increased by 17% while from 1985 to 2000, those living on less than one dollar a day increased by 18 percent. Even the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress admitted that there is a mere 40 percent success rate 
of all World Bank projects. In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70%. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion, while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20% to 6%. In fact, by the year 2000, 50% of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand, the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions, as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are U.S. based. Walmart, General Motors, and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia, and many others and as protective trade barriers are broken down currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism the empire expands you get up on your little 21 inch screen and howl about america and democracy there is no america there is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly based not on human life but financial and corporate power. And as the inequality grows naturally more and more people are becoming desperate. So the establishment was forced to come up with a new way to deal with anyone who challenges the system. So they gave birth to the terrorist. The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s. In 2007, the Department of Defense received $161.8 billion for the so-called global war on terrorism. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, in 2004, roughly 2,000 people were killed internationally due to supposed terrorist acts. Of that number, 70 were American. Using this number as a general average, which is extremely generous, it is interesting to note that twice as many people die from peanut allergies a year than from terrorist acts. 
Concurrently, the leading cause of death in America is coronary heart disease, killing roughly 450,000 each year. And in 2007, the government's allocation of funds for research on this issue was about $3 billion. This means that the US government in 2007 spent 54 times the amount for preventing terrorism than it spent for preventing a disease which kills 6,600 times more people annually than terrorism does. Yet, as the name terrorism and Al-Qaeda are arbitrarily stamped on every news report relating to any action taken against U.S. interests, the myth grows wider. In mid-2008, the U.S. Attorney General actually proposed that the U.S. Congress officially declare war against the fantasy. Not to mention, as of July 2008, there are now over one million people currently on the U.S. terrorist watch list. These so-called counterterrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that condemns poor populations to sweatshop slavery for the benefit of Madison Avenue? Or that engineers false flag terror attacks for the sake of manipulation? Or that generates built-in modes of social operation which are inherently exploitative? Or that systematically reduces civil liberties and violates human rights in order to protect itself from its own shortcomings? How do we deal with the numerous covert institutions such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, and other undemocratically elected groups which, behind closed doors, collude to control the political, financial, social, and environmental elements of our lives? In order to find the answer, we must first find the true underlying cause. For the fact is, the selfish, corrupt, power and profit based groups are not the true source of the problem. They are symptoms. My name is Jock Fresco. I'm an industrial designer and a social engineer. I'm very much interested in society and developing a system that might be sustainable for all people. First of all, the word corruption is a monetary invention. That aberrant behavior, behavior that's disruptive to the well-being of people, 
while you're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior appears to be environmentally determined, meaning if you were raised by the Seminole Indians as a baby, never saw anything else, you'd hold that value system. And this goes for nations, it goes for individuals, for families. They try to indoctrinate their children to their particular faith and their country and make them feel like they're part of that. And they build a society which they call established. They establish a workable point of view and tend to perpetuate that. Whereas all societies are really emergent, not established. And so they fight new ideas that would interfere with the establishment. Governments try to perpetuate that which keeps them in power. People are not elected to political office to change things. They're put there to keep things the way they are. So you see, the basis of corruption is in our society. I mean, make it clear, all nations then are basically corrupt because they tend to uphold existing institutions. I don't mean to uphold or downgrade all nations, but communism, socialism, fascism, the free enterprise system, and all other subcultures are the same. They are all basically corrupt. The most fundamental characteristic of our social institutions is the necessity for self-preservation. Whether dealing with a corporation, a religion, or a government, the foremost interest is to preserve the institution itself. For instance, the last thing an oil company would ever want is the utilization of energy that was outside of its control, for it makes that company less relevant to society. Likewise, the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union was, in reality, a way to preserve and perpetuate the established economic and global hegemony of the United States. Similarly, religions conditioned people to feel guilty for natural inclinations, each claiming to offer the only path to forgiveness and salvation. At the heart of this institutional self-preservation lies the monetary system. For it is money that provides the means for power and survival. Therefore, just as a poor person might be forced to steal in order to survive, it is a natural inclination to do whatever is needed to continue an institution's profitability. This makes it inherently difficult for profit-based institutions to change, for it puts in jeopardy not only the survival of large groups of people, but also the coveted materialistic lifestyles associated with affluence and power. Therefore, the paralyzing necessity to preserve an institution, regardless of its social relevance, is largely rooted in the need for money or profit. What's in it for me is why people think. And so if a man makes money selling a certain product, naturally he's going to fight the existence of another product that may threaten his institution. Therefore, people cannot be fair. And people do not trust each other. A guy will come over to you and say, I got just the house you're looking for. He's a salesman. When a doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out, I don't know if he's trying to pay off a yacht or whether my kidney has to come out. It's hard in a monetary system to trust people. If you came into my store and I said, this lamp that I've got is pretty good, but the lamp in the next door is much better, I wouldn't be in business very long. It wouldn't work. If I were ethical, it wouldn't work. So when you say industry cares for people, that's not true. They can't afford to be ethical. So your system is not designed to serve the well-being of people. If you still don't understand that, there would be no outsourcing of jobs if they cared about people. Industry does not care. They only hire people because it hasn't been automated yet. So don't talk about decency and ethics. We cannot afford it and remain in business. It is important to point out that regardless of the social system, whether fascist, socialist, capitalist, or communist, the underlying mechanism is still money, labor, and competition. Communist China is no less capitalistic than the United States. 
The only difference is the degree by which the state intervenes in enterprise. The reality is that monetaryism, so to speak, is the true mechanism that guides the interests of all the countries on the planet. The most aggressive and hence dominant variation of this monetaryism is the free enterprise system. The fundamental perspective as put forth by early free market economists like Adam Smith is that self-interest in competition leads to social prosperity as the act of competition creates incentive which motivates people to persevere. However, what isn't talked about is how a competition-based economy invariably leads to strategic corruption, power and wealth consolidation, social stratification, technological paralysis, labor abuse, and ultimately, a covert form of government dictatorship by the rich elite. The word corruption is often defined as moral perversion. If a company dumps toxic waste into the ocean to save money, most people recognize this as corrupt behavior. On a more subtle level, when Walmart moves into a small town and forces small businesses to shut down for they are unable to compete, a gray area emerges. For what exactly is Walmart doing wrong? Why should they care about mom and pop organizations they destroy? Yet even more subtly, when a person gets fired from their job because a new machine has been created which can do the work for less money, people tend to just accept that as the way it is, not seeing the inherent corrupt inhumanity of such an action. Because the fact is, whether it is dumping toxic waste, having a monopoly enterprise, or downsizing the workforce, the motive is the same, profit. They are all different degrees of the same self-preserving mechanism which always puts the well-being of people second to monetary gain. Therefore, corruption is not some byproduct of monetarism. It is the very foundation. And while most people acknowledge this tendency on one level or another, the majority remains naive as to the broad ramifications of having such a selfish mechanism as the guiding mentality in society. Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The U.S. government allowed it to happen. The FDA allowed this to happen. And now the government is completely looking the other way. Thousands of innocent hemophiliacs have died from the AIDS virus. This company knew absolutely that it was infected with AIDS. They dumped it because they wanted to turn this disaster into a profit. So you see, you have built-in corruption. We're all chiseling off each other, and you can't expect decency in that sort of thing. And feeling that, they don't know who to elect. They think in terms of a democracy, which is not possible in a monetary-based economy. If you have more money to advertise your position, the position you desire in government, that isn't a democracy. It serves those in positions of differential advantage. So it's always a dictatorship of the elitists, the financially wealthy. It is an interesting observation to note how seemingly unknown personalities magically appear on the scene as presidential candidates. Then, before you know it, somehow you are left to choose from a small group of extremely wealthy people who suspiciously have the same broad social view. Obviously, it's a joke. The people placed on the ballot are done so because they have been pre-decided to be acceptable by the established financial powers who actually run the show. Yet, many who understand this illusion of democracy often think, if only we could just get our honest, ethical politicians in power, then we would be okay. Well, while this idea of course seems reasonable in our established, oriented world view, it is, unfortunately, another fallacy. For when it really comes down to what is actually important, the institution of politics and thus politicians themselves 
have absolutely no true relevance as to what makes our world and society function. It's not politicians that can solve problems. They have no technical capabilities. They don't know how to solve problems. Even if they were sincere, they don't know how to solve problems. It's the technicians that produce the desalinization plants. It's the technicians that give you electricity, that give you motor vehicles, that heat your house and cool it in the summertime. It's technology that solves problems, not politics. Politics cannot solve problems because they're not trained to do so. Very few people today stop and consider what it is that actually improves their lives. Is it money? Obviously not. One cannot eat money or stuff money into their car to get it to run. Is it politics? All politicians can do is create laws, establish budgets, and declare war. Is it religion? Of course not. Religion creates nothing except intangible emotional solace for those who require it. The true gift that we as human beings have, which has been solely responsible for everything that has improved our lives, is technology. What is technology? Technology is a pencil which allows one to solidify ideas on paper for communication. Technology is an automobile which allows one to travel faster than feet would allow. Technology is a pair of eyeglasses which enables sight for those who need it. Applied technology itself is merely an extension of human attributes which reduces human effort, freeing humans from a particular chore or problem. Imagine what your life would be like today without a telephone, or an oven, or a computer, or an airplane. Everything in your home which you take for granted, from a doorbell, to a table, to a dishwasher, is technology generated from the creative, scientific ingenuity of human technicians. Not money, politics, or religion. These are false institutions. And writing your congressman is fantastic. They tell you to write your congressman if you want something done. The men in Washington should be at the forefront of technology, the forefront of human studies, the forefront of crime, all the factors that shape human behavior. You don't have to write your congressman. What kind of people are they that are, that are appointed to do that job? The future will have great difficulty. And the question that's raised by politicians is how much will a project cost? The question is not how much will it cost? Do we have the resources? And we have the resources today to house everyone, build hospitals all over the world, build schools all over the world, the finest equipment and labs for teaching and doing medical research. So you see, we have all that, but we're in a monetary system. And in the monetary system, there's profit. And what is the fundamental mechanism that drives the profit system besides self-interest? What is it exactly that maintains that competitive edge at its core? Is it high efficiency and sustainability? No, that isn't part of their design. Nothing produced in our profit-based society is even remotely sustainable or efficient. If it was, there wouldn't be a multi-million dollar a year service industry for automobiles. Nor would the average lifespan for most electronics be less than three months before they're obsolete. Is it abundance? Absolutely not. Abundance, as based on the laws of supply and demand, is actually a negative thing. If a diamond company finds ten times the usual amount of diamonds during their mining, it means the supply of diamonds has increased, which means the cost and profit per diamond drops. The fact is, efficiency, sustainability, and abundance are enemies of profit. To put it into a word, it is the mechanism of scarcity that increases profits. What is scarcity? Based on keeping products valuable, slowing up production on oil raises the price. Maintaining scarcity of diamonds keeps the price high. They burn diamonds at the Kimberley diamond mines. They're made of carbon. That keeps the price up. So then, what does it mean for society when scarcity, either produced naturally or through manipulation, 
is a beneficial condition for industry. It means that sustainability and abundance will never ever occur in a profit system for it simply goes against the very nature of the structure. Therefore, it is impossible to have a world without war or poverty. It is impossible to continually advance technology to its most efficient and productive states. And most dramatically, it is impossible to expect human beings to behave in truly ethical or decent ways. People use the word instinct because they can't account for the behavior. They sit back and they evaluate with their lack of knowledge, you know, and they say things like, humans are built a certain way, greed is a natural thing, as though they've worked for years on it, and it's no more natural than wearing clothing. What we want to do is to eliminate the causes of the problems eliminate the processes that, that produce greed and bigotry and prejudice and um, people taking advantage of one another and elitism, eliminating the need for prisons and welfare. We have always had these problems because we have always lived within scarcity and barter and monetary systems that produce scarcity. If you eradicate the conditions that generate what you call socially offensive behavior, it does not exist. The guy said, well, isn't that inborn? No, it's not. There is no human nature. There's human behavior, and that's always been changed throughout history. You're not born with bigotry and greed and corruption and hatred. You, you pick that up within the society. War, poverty, corruption, hunger, misery, human suffering will not change in a monetary system. That is, there'll be very little significant change. It's going to take the redesign of our culture, our values, and it has to be related to the carrying capacity of the earth, not some human opinion or some politician's notions of the way the world ought to be, or some religious notions of the conduct of human affairs. And that's what the Venus Project is about. The society that we're about to talk about is a society that is free of all the old superstitions, incarceration, prisons, police, cruelty, and law. All laws will disappear, and the professions will disappear that are no longer valid, such as stockbrokers, bankers, advertising, gone forever, because it's no longer relevant. When we understand that it is technology devised by human ingenuity which frees humanity and increases our quality of life, we then realize that the most important focus we can have is on the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. For it is from these natural resources we gain the materials to continue our path of prosperity. Understanding this, we then see that money fundamentally exists as a barrier to these resources for virtually everything has a financial cost. And why do we need money to obtain these resources? Because of real or assumed scarcity. We don't usually pay for air and tap water because it is in such high abundance selling it would be pointless. So then. Logically speaking, if resources and technologies applicable to creating everything in our societies, such as houses, cities, and transportation, were in high enough abundance, there would be no reason to sell anything. Likewise, if automation and machinery was so technologically advanced as to relieve human beings of labor, there would be no reason to have a job. And with these social aspects taken care of, there would be no reason to have money at all. So the ultimate question remains. Do we on earth have enough resources and technological understanding to create a society of such abundance that everything we have now could be available without a price tag and without the need for submission through employment? Yes, we do. We have the resources and technology to enable this at a minimum. 
along with the ability to raise the standard of living so high that people in the future will look back at our civilization now and gawk at how primitive and immature our society was. What the Venus Project proposes is an entirely different system that's updated to present day knowledge. We've never given scientists the problem of how do you design a society which would eliminate boring and monotonous jobs, that would eliminate accidents in transportation, that would enable people to have a high standard of living, that would eliminate poisons in our food, that would give us other sources of energy that are clean and efficient. We can do that out there. The major difference between a resource-based economy and a monetary system is that a resource-based economy is really concerned with people and their well-being, where a monetary system has become so distorted that the concerns of the people are really secondary, if they're there at all. The products that are turned out are for how much money you can get. If there is a problem in society and you can't earn money from solving that problem, then it won't be done. The resource-based economy is really not close to anything that's been tried. And with all our technology today, we can create abundance. It could be used to improve everyone's lifestyle. Abundance all over the world if we use our technology wisely and maintain the environment. It's a very different system, and it's very hard to talk about because the public is not that well enough informed as to the state of technology. At present, we don't have to burn fossil fuels. We don't have to use anything that would contaminate the environment. There are many sources of energy available. Alternative energy solutions pushed by the establishment, such as hydrogen, biomass, and even nuclear, are highly insufficient, dangerous, and exist only to perpetuate the profit structure that industry has created. When we look beyond the propaganda and self-serving solutions put forth by the energy companies, we find a seemingly endless stream of clean, abundant and renewable energy for generating power. Solar and wind energy are well known to the public, but the true potential of these mediums remains unexpressed. Solar energy, derived from the sun, has such abundance that one hour of light at high noon contains more energy than what the entire world consumes in a year. If we could capture one hundredth of a percent of this energy, the world would never have to use oil, gas or anything else. The question then is not availability, but the technology to harness it. And there are many advanced mediums today which could accomplish just that if they were not hindered by the need to compete for market share with the established energy power structures. Then there's wind energy. Wind energy has long been denounced as weak and due to being location driven, impractical. This is simply not true. The US Department of Energy admitted in 2007 that if wind was fully harvested in just three of America's 50 states, it could power the entire nation. And then there are the rather unknown mediums of tidal and wave power. Tidal power is derived from tidal shifts in the ocean. Installing turbines which capture this movement generates energy. In the United Kingdom, 42 sites are currently noted as available, forecasting that 34% of all the UK's energy could come from tidal power alone. Wave power, which extracts energy from the surface motions of the ocean, is estimated to have a global potential of up to 80,000 terawatt hours a year. This means 50% of the entire planet's energy usage could be produced from this medium alone. Now, it is important to point out that tidal, wave, solar and wind power requires virtually no preliminary energy to harness, unlike coal, oil, gas, biomass, hydrogen and all the others. In combination, these four mediums alone, if efficiently harnessed through technology, could power the world forever. That being said, there happens to be another form of clean, renewable energy which trumps them all. Geothermal power. Geothermal energy utilizes what is called heat mining, which, through a simple process using water, is able to generate massive amounts of clean energy. 
In 2006, an MIT report on geothermal energy found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the Earth, with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being easily tappable with improved technology. The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is about half of a zettajoule a year. This means about 4,000 years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. And when we understand that the Earth's heat generation is constantly renewed, this energy is really limitless and could be used forever. These energy sources are only a few of the clean, renewable mediums available. And as time goes on, we will find more. The grand realization is that we have total energy abundance without the need for pollution, traditional conservation, or in fact, a price tag. And what about transportation? The prevailing means of transportation in our societies is by automobile and aircraft, both of which predominantly need fossil fuels to run. In the case of the automobile, the battery technology needed to power an electric car that can go over 100 miles an hour for over 200 miles on one charge exists and has existed for many years. However, due to battery patents controlled by the oil industry, which limits their availability to maintain market share, coupled with political pressure from the energy industry, the accessibility and affordability of this technology is limited. There is absolutely no reason other than pure corrupt profit interest that every single vehicle in the world cannot be electric and utterly clean, with zero need for gasoline. As far as airplanes, it is time we realize that this means of travel is inefficient, cumbersome, slow, and causes far too much pollution. This is a maglev train. It uses magnets for propulsion. It is fully suspended by a magnetic field and requires less than 2% of the energy used for plane travel. The train has no wheels so nothing can wear out. The current maximum speed of versions of this technology as used in Japan is 361 miles per hour. However, this version of the technology is very dated. An organization called ET3, which has connections with the Venus Project, has established a tube-based maglev that can travel up to 4,000 miles per hour in a motionless, frictionless tube, which can go over land or underwater. Imagine going from LA to New York for an extended lunch break, or from Washington DC to Beijing, China in two hours. This is the future of continental and intercontinental travel, fast, clean, with only a fraction of the energy usage we use today for the same means. In fact, between maglev technology, advanced battery storage, and geothermal energy, there would be no reason to ever burn fossil fuels again. And we can do this now, if we were not held back by the paralyzing profit structure. Now America is inclined toward fascism. It has a propensity by its dominant philosophy and religion to uphold the fascist point of view. American industry is essentially a fascist institution. If you don't understand that, the minute you punch that time clock, you walk into a dictatorship. We're given notions about the respectability of work, and um, I really look at it as being paid slavery. They're brought up to believe that you shall earn your living by the sweat of your brow. That holds people back, freeing people from drudgery, repetitive jobs which make them ignorant. You rob them. In our society, that is a resource-based economy, machines free people. You see, we can't imagine that because we've never known that kind of world. If we look back at history, we see a very clear pattern of machine automation slowly replacing human labor. From the disappearance of the elevator man to the near full automation of an automobile production plant, the fact is, as technology grows, the need for humans in the workforce will continually be diminished. This creates a serious clash, which proves the falseness of the monetary-based labor system. For human employment is in direct competition with technological development. Therefore, given the fundamental priority of profit by industry, 
people through time will be continually laid off and replaced by machine. When industry takes on the machine, instead of shortening the workday, they downsize. You lose your job. So you have a right to fear machines. In a high technology, resource based economy, it is conservative to say that about 90% of all current occupations could be phased out by machines, freeing humans to live their life without servitude. For this is the point of technology itself. And through time, with nanotechnology and other highly advanced forms of science, it is not far-fetched to see how even complex medical procedures could be performed by machines as well, and based on the pattern, with much higher success rates than humans get today. The path is clear, but our monetary-based structure, which requires labor for income, blocks this progress, for humans need jobs in order to survive. The bottom line is that this system must go, or we will never be free and technology will be constantly paralyzed. When you have machines that clean out sewers, it frees a human being from doing that. So look at machines as extensions of human performance. Furthermore, many occupations today will have simply no basis to exist in a resource-based economy, such as anything associated with the management of money, advertising, along with the legal system itself. For without money, a great majority of the crimes that are committed today would never occur. Virtually all forms of crime are a consequence of the monetary system, either directly or by neuroses, inflicted through financial deprivation. Therefore, laws themselves could eventually become extinct. Instead of putting up a sign, drive carefully, slippery when wet, put abrasive in the highway so it's not slippery when wet. And if a person gets in a car that drunk and a car oscillates a great deal, there's a little pendulum that swings up and back and that'll pull the car over to the side. Not a law. Solution. Put sonar and radar in automobiles so they can't hit one another. Man-made laws are attempts to deal with occurring problems and not knowing how to solve them, they make a law. In the United States, the most privatized capitalist country on the planet, it should come as no surprise that it also has the largest prison population in the world, growing every year. Statistically, most of these people are uneducated and come from poor, deprived societies. And contrary to propaganda, it is this environmental conditioning which lures them into criminal and violent behavior. However, society looks the other way in regard to this point. The legal and prison systems are just more examples of how our society avoids examining the root causes of behavior. Billions are spent each year on prisons and police, while only a fraction is spent on programs for poverty, which is one of the most fundamental variables responsible for crime to begin with. And as long as we have an economic system which prefers and in fact creates scarcity and deprivation, crime will never go away. If people have access to the necessities of life without servitude, debt, barter, trade, they behave very differently. You want all these things available without a price tag. Now then, you've got to have a price tag. Well, what will motivate people? A uh, man gets everything he wants, he just lay around in the sun. This is a myth they perpetuate. People in our culture are trained to believe that the monetary system produces incentive. If they have access to things, why should they want to do anything? They will lose their incentive. That's what you're taught to support the monetary system. When you take money out of the scenario, there would be different in incentives, very different incentives. When people have access to the necessities of life, their incentives change. What about the moon and the stars? New incentives arise. If you make a painting that you enjoy, you will enjoy giving it to other people, not selling it. I think most of the education that I've seen today is essentially producing 
a person for a job. It's very specialized. They're not generalists. People don't know a lot about a lot of different subjects. I, I don't think you could get people to go to war if, if they knew a lot about a lot of things. I think education is mostly rote and they're not taught how to solve problems. They're not given the tools emotionally or within their own field of how to do critical thinking. A resource-based economy, the education would be very different. Our society's major concern is mental development and to motivate each person to their highest potential. Because our philosophy is the smarter people are, the richer the world, because everybody becomes a contributor. The smarter your kids are, the better my life will be, because they'll be contributing more constructively to the, to the environment and to my life, because everything that we devise within a resource-based economy would be applied to society. There would be nothing to hold it back. Patriotism, weapons, armies, navies, all that is a sign that we're not civilized yet. Kids will ask their parents, didn't you see the necessity of machines? Dad, couldn't you see that war was inevitable when you produce scarcity? Isn't it obvious? Of course the kid will understand that you were pinheads raised merely to serve the established institutions. We're such an abominable, sick society that we won't make the history book. They just say that large nations took land from smaller nations, used force and violence. You'll get history talked about as corrupt behavior all the way along until the beginning of the civilized world. That's when all the nations work together. World unification, working toward common good for all human beings and without anyone being subservient to anyone else, without social stratification, whether it be technical elitism or any other kind of elitism eradicated from the face of the earth. The state does nothing because there is no state. There is no state. The system I advocate, a resource-based global economy, is not perfect. It's just a lot better than what we have. We can never achieve perfection. The social values of our society, which has manifested in perpetual warfare, corruption, oppressive laws, social stratification, irrelevant superstitions, environmental destruction, and a despotic, socially indifferent, profit-oriented ruling class, is fundamentally the result of a collective ignorance of two of the most basic insights humans can have about reality, the emergent and symbiotic aspects of natural law. The emergent nature of reality is that all systems, whether it is knowledge, society, technology, philosophy, or any other creation, will, when uninhibited, undergo fluid, perpetual change. What we consider commonplace today, such as modern communication and transportation, would have been unimaginable in ancient times. Likewise, the future will contain technologies, realizations, and social structures that we cannot even fathom in the present. We have gone from alchemy to chemistry, from a geocentric universe to a heliocentric, from believing that demons were the cause of illness to modern medicine. This development shows no sign of ending, and it is this awareness that aligns us and leads us on a continuous path to growth and progress. Static, empirical knowledge does not exist. Rather, it is the insight of the emergence of all systems we must recognize. This means we must be open to new information at all times, even if it threatens our current belief system and hence identities. Sadly, society today has failed to recognize this and the established institutions continue to paralyze growth by preserving outdated social structures. Simultaneously, the population suffers from a fear of change, for their conditioning assumes a static identity, and challenging one's belief system 
usually results in insult and apprehension. For being wrong is erroneously associated with failure. When, in fact, to be proven wrong should be celebrated, for it is elevating someone to a new level of understanding, furthering awareness. The fact is, there is no such thing as a smart human being, for it is merely a matter of time before their ideas are updated, changed, or eradicated. And this tendency to blindly hold on to a belief system, sheltering it from new, possibly transforming information, is nothing less than a form of intellectual materialism. The monetary system perpetuates this materialism not only by its self-preserving structures, but also through the countless number of people who have been conditioned into blindly and thoughtlessly upholding these structures, therefore becoming self-appointed guardians of the status quo. Sheep, which no longer need a sheepdog to control them, for they control each other by ostracizing those who step out of the norm. This tendency to resist change and uphold existing institutions for the sake of identity, comfort, power and profit is completely unsustainable and will only produce further imbalance, fragmentation, distortion and invariably destruction. It's time to change. From hunters and gatherers to the agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution, the pattern is clear. It is time for a new social system which reflects the understandings we have today. The monetary system is a product of a period of time where scarcity was a reality. Now with the age of technology it is no longer relevant to society. Gone with the aberrant behavior it manifests. Likewise, dominant world views such as theistic religion operate with the same social irrelevancy. Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism and all of the others exist as barriers to personal and social growth. For each group perpetuates a closed world view. And this finite understanding that they acknowledge is simply not possible in an emergent universe. Yet religion has succeeded in shutting down the awareness of this emergence by instilling the psychological distortion of faith upon its followers where logic and new information is rejected in favor of traditionalized outdated beliefs. The concept of God is really a method of accounting for the nature of things. In the early days people didn't know enough about how things formed, how nature worked, so they invented their own little stories and they made God in their own image, a guy that gets angry. When people don't behave right, he creates floods and earthquakes. And they say it's an act of God. A cursory glance at the suppressed history of religion reveals that even the foundational myths themselves are emergent culminations, developed through influence over time. For example, a cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Christ. This notion is so important that the Bible itself states, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yet it is very difficult to take this account literally, for not only is there no primary source denoting this supernatural event in secular history, awareness of the enormous number of pre-Christian saviors who also died and were resurrected immediately puts the story in mythological territory by association. Early church figures such as Tertullian went to great lengths to break these associations, even claiming that the devil caused the similarities to occur, stating in the second century, the devil, whose business is to pervert the truth, mimics the exact circumstance of the divine sacraments. He baptizes his believers and promises forgiveness of sins. He celebrates the oblation of bread and brings in the symbol of the resurrection. Let us therefore acknowledge the craftiness of the devil who copied certain things of those that be divine. What is truly sad, however, is that when we cease the idea that the stories from Christianity, Judaism, Islam and all the others are literal history and accept them for what they really are, which are purely allegorical expressions 
derived from many faiths, we see that all religions share a common thread. And it is this unifying imperative that needs to be recognized and appreciated. Religious belief has caused more fragmentation and conflict than any other ideology. Christianity alone has 34,000 different subgroups. The Bible is subject to interpretation. When you read it, you say, I think Jesus meant this. I think Job meant that. Oh no, he meant this. So you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, and a church divided is no church at all. And a church divided is no church at all. And this point on division, which is a trademark of all theistic religions, brings us to our second failure of awareness, the false assumption of separation through the rejection of the symbiotic relationship of life. Apart from the understanding that all natural systems are emergent, where all notions of reality will be constantly developed, altered, and even eradicated, we must also understand that all systems are, in fact, invented fragments, merely for the sake of conversation. For there is no such thing as independence in nature. The whole of nature is a unified system of interdependent variables, each a cause and a reaction, existing only as a concentrated whole. You don't see the plug connected to the environment, so it looks like we're free, wandering around. Take the oxygen away, we all die immediately. Take plant life away, we die. And without the sun, all the plants die. So we are connected. We really must take into account the totality. This isn't just a human experience on this planet. This is a total experience. And we know we can't survive without plants and animals. We know we can't survive without the four elements, you know. And so when are we going to really start taking that into account? That's what it is to be successful. Success depends on how well we relate to everything around us. I'm very aware of the fact that my grandson cannot possibly hope to inherit a sustainable, peaceful, stable, socially just world unless every child today growing up in Ethiopia, in Indonesia, in Bolivia, in Palestine, in Israel also has that same expectation. You've got to take care of the whole community or you're going to have serious problems. And now we have to see that the whole world is the community. And we must all take care of each other that way. And it's not just a community of human beings. It's a community of plants and animals and elements. And we really need to understand that. That's what's going to bring us joy, too, and pleasure. That's what's missing in our lives right now. We can call it spirituality. But the fact of the matter is, joy comes from that bliss of connectedness. That's our God spirit. That's that side of ourselves that really feels it. And you can feel it deep inside you. It's this amazing, wonderful feeling. And you know it when you get it. You don't get it from money. You get it from connection. Now, if that isn't a hazard to this country, how are we going to keep building nuclear weapons? You know what I mean? What's going to happen to the arms industry when we realize we're all one? <laughs> It's gonna fuck up the economy. The economy that's fake anyway. 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 <laughs> Which would be a real bummer. You can see why the government's cracking down on the idea of experiencing unconditional love. Once we understand that the integrity of our personal existences are completely dependent on the integrity of everything else in our world, we have truly understood the meaning of unconditional love. For love is extensionality, and seeing everything as you and you as everything can have no conditionalities. For, in fact, we are all everything at once. If it's true that we're all from the center of a star, every atom in each of us from the center of a star, then we're all the same thing. Even a Coke machine or a cigarette butt in the street in Buffalo is made out of atoms that came from a star. They've all been recycled thousands of times, as have you and I. And therefore, it's only me out there. 
So what is there to be afraid of? What is there that needs solace seeking? Nothing. There's nothing to be afraid of because it's all us. The trouble is we have been separated by being born and given a name and an identity and being individuated. We've been separated from the oneness and that's what religion exploits, that people have this yearning to be part of the overall one again. So they exploit that. They call it God. They say he has rules. And I think it's cruel. I think you can do it absent religion. It's time to claim the unity our outmoded social systems have broken apart and work together to create a sustainable global society where everyone is taken care of and everyone is truly free. Your personal beliefs, whatever they may be, are meaningless when it comes to the necessities of life. Every human being is born naked, needing warmth, food, water, shelter. Everything else is auxiliary. Therefore, the most important issue at hand is the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. This can never be accomplished in a monetary system, for the pursuit of profit is the pursuit of self-interest, and therefore imbalance is inherent. Simultaneously, politicians are useless, for our true problems in life are technical, not political. Furthermore, ideologies that separate humanity, such as religion, need strong reflection in the community in regard to its value, purpose, and social relevancy. Hopefully, through time, religion will lose its materialism and basis in superstition and move into the useful field of philosophy. The fact is, society today is backwards, with politicians constantly talking about protection and security rather than creation, unity, and progress. The U.S. alone now spends about $500 billion annually on defense. That is enough to send every high school senior in America to a four-year college. In the 1940s, the Manhattan Project produced the first true weapon of mass destruction. This program employed 130,000 people at an extreme financial cost. Imagine what our life would be like today if that group of scientists instead of working on a way of killing people, worked on a way to create a self-sustaining, abundant world. Life today would be very, very different if that was their goal. Instead of weapons of mass destruction, it is time to unleash something much more powerful. Weapons of mass creation. Our true divinity is in our ability to create and armed with the understanding of the symbiotic connections of life while being guided by the emergent nature of reality there is nothing we cannot do or accomplish of course we face strong barriers in the form of established power structures that refuse to change at the heart of these structures is the monetary system as explained earlier the fractional reserve policy is a form of slavery through debt where it is literally impossible for society to be free. In turn, free market capitalism in the form of free trade uses debt to imprison the world and manipulate countries into subservience to a handful of large business and political powers. Apart from these obvious amoralities, the system itself is based on competition, which immediately destroys the possibility of large-scale collaborations for the common good, hence paralyzing any attempt at true global sustainability. These financial and corporate structures are now obsolete and they must be outgrown. Of course we cannot be naive enough to think that the business and financial elite are going to subscribe to this idea for they will lose power and control. Therefore peaceful yet highly strategic action must be taken. The most powerful course of action is simple. We have to alter our behavior 
to force the power structure to the will of the people. We must stop supporting the system. The only way the establishment will change is by our refusal to participate while continuously acknowledging its endless flaws and corruptions. They're not going to give up the monetary system because of our designs of what we recommend. The system has to fail and people have to lose confidence in their elected leaders. That will be a major turning point if the Venus Project is offered as a possible alternative. If not, I fear the consequences. The trends now indicate that our country is going bankrupt. The probability is our country will move toward a military dictatorship to prevent riots and complete social breakdown. Once the U.S. breaks down, all the other cultures will undergo similar things. As of now, the world financial system is on the brink of collapse due to its own shortcomings. The Comptroller of Currency stated in 2003 that the interest on the U.S. national debt will not be affordable in less than 10 years. This theoretically means total bankruptcy for the U.S. economy, and its implications for the world are immense. In turn, the fractional reserve-based monetary system is reaching its theoretical limits of expansion, and the banking failures you are seeing are just the beginning. This is why inflation is skyrocketing, all debt is at record levels, and the government and Fed are hemorrhaging new money to bail out the corrupt system. For the only way to keep the banks going is by making more money. The only way to make more money is to create more debt and inflation. It is simply a matter of time before the tables turn and there is no one willing to take new loans while defaults grow as people are unable to afford their current loans. Then the expansion of money will stop and contraction will begin on a scale never before seen, ending a century-long pyramid scheme. This has already begun. Therefore, we need to expose this financial failure for what it is, using this weakness to our advantage. Here are some suggestions. Expose the banking fraud. Citibank, JP Morgan Chase, and Bank of America are the most powerful controllers within the corrupt Federal Reserve System. It's time to boycott these institutions. If you have a bank account or a credit card with any of them, move your money to another bank. If you have a mortgage, refinance with another bank. If you own their stock, sell it. If you work for them, quit. This gesture will express contempt for the true powers behind the private banking cartel known as the Federal Reserve and create awareness about the fraud of the banking system itself. Two. Turn off the TV news. Visit the emerging independent news agencies on the internet for your information. CNN, NBC, ABC, Fox, and all the others present all news pre-filtered to maintain the status quo. With four corporations owning all major media outlets, objective information is impossible. This is the true beauty of the internet, and the establishment has been losing control because of this free flow of information. We must protect the internet at all times, as it is truly our savior right now. 3. Don't ever allow yourself, your family, or anyone you know to ever join the military. This is an obsolete institution now used exclusively for maintaining an establishment that is no longer relevant. U.S. soldiers in Iraq work for U.S. corporations, not the people. Propaganda forces us to believe that war is natural and the military is an honorable institution. Well, if war is natural, why are there 18 suicides every single day by American veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder? If our military men and women are so honored, why is it that 25% of the American homeless population are veterans? Four, stop supporting the energy companies. If you live in a detached house, get off the grid. Investigate every means of making your home self-sustainable with clean energy. Solar, wind, and other renewable energies are now affordable consumer realities, and considering the never-ending rising cost of traditional energies, it will likely be a cheaper investment over time. If you drive, get the smallest car you can, and consider using one of the many conversion technologies that can enable your car to be a hybrid, electric, 
or run on anything other than establishment fuels. 5. Reject the political system. The illusion of democracy is an insult to our intelligence. In a monetary system there is no such thing as a true democracy, and there never was. We have two political parties owned by the same set of corporate lobbyists. They are placed in their positions by the corporations, with popularity artificially projected by their media. In a system of inherent corruption, the change of personnel every couple of years has very little relevance. Instead of pretending that the political game has any true meaning, focus your energy on how to transcend this failed system. And six, join the movement. Go to the zeitgeistmovement.com and help us create the largest mass movement for social change the world has ever seen. We must mobilize and educate everyone about the inherent corruption of our current world system, along with the only true sustainable solution, declaring all the natural resources on the planet as common heritage to all people, while informing everyone as to the true state of technology and how we can all be free if the world works together rather than fights. The choice lies with you. You can continue to be a slave to the financial system and watch the continuous wars, depressions, and injustice across the globe while placating yourself with vain entertainment and materialistic garbage. Or you can focus your energy on true, meaningful, lasting, holistic change, which actually has the realistic ability to support and free all humans with no one left behind. But in the end, the most relevant change must occur first inside of you. The real revolution is the revolution of consciousness, and each one of us first needs to eliminate the divisionary materialistic noise we have been conditioned to think is true, while discovering, amplifying, and aligning with the signal coming from our true empirical oneness. It is up to you. What we are trying in all these discussions and talks here is to see if we cannot radically bring about a transformation of the mind. Not accept things as they are, but to understand it, to go into it, to examine it. Give your heart and your mind with everything that you have to find out a way of living differently. But that depends on you and not somebody else. Because in this there is no teacher, no pupil. There is no leader. There is no guru. There is no master, no savior. You yourself are the teacher and the pupil. You are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader. You are everything. And to understand is to transform what is.